Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to ancient Greece to hear the story of Theseus, the mythical king and founder of Athens, as he embarks on several quests across the beautiful countryside and through the ancient cities of this breathtaking region of the world. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to unwind and find peace in the space that we are in, here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Notice the points where your body is in contact with the bed, how your legs are cradled by the soft, plush mattress, how your hips and torso are supported and embraced by this cozy little oasis. Notice how it feels to finally be at rest after a long day. There are no expectations or obligations here. By simply listening to the sound of my voice and coming on this journey with me, you are drifting into slow relaxation. With your eyes closed and your body sinking deeper and deeper into the mattress beneath you, Try and picture a glowing orange light just outside your window. It is an orb that glistens and shimmers, illuminating everything around it in its soft, warm light. It will light up whatever it is outside your window. Perhaps a tree or a bush, or a car, or even just the cool night air. Picture in your mind as the orb gently taps against your window. It lets out a soft tink as it does so, like a courteous knock from a kind old friend. The window magically opens, and with it, comes a cool night breeze that brushes against your legs, making the blankets around you somehow feel even warmer and more inviting. The orb floats into the room gently on the breeze, illuminating the walls, ceiling, and floor in that comforting, warm light. Picture it lighting up the items on your nightstand or TV stand, casting beautiful little shadows on the wall. But then, you notice something peculiar about the orb, something interesting. Every time you breathe in, the orb grows a bit larger. It goes from being the size of a cupcake to the size of a large, round watermelon. And when you breathe out, the orb becomes smaller, shrinking back down to the size of the cupcake. Watch for a moment as you breathe in and the orb grows. and breathe out, and it shrinks. As you breathe in, and the orb grows, and breathe out, and it shrinks. As you breathe in, and the orb grows, and breathe out, and it shrinks. Slowly, the orb 
lowers down toward your body. With it, it brings a warmth that radiates from its core, like a hot heating pad or a gentle, crackling bonfire. The orb glides down to your legs, hovering just over them. Feel as that light and warmth splashes against your legs, causing them to relax more and more. Feel as the orb melts away any tension that you've been carrying with you. Your legs sink deeper and deeper into the mattress now, completely and totally relaxed. Then, the orb slowly travels up your body. It hovers just above your stomach and slowly lowers. Feel its warmth as it releases and soothes any discomfort you've been carrying in your stomach or abdomen. You're no longer carrying any nervousness or tension there. All your muscles are completely at ease. Then, the orb continues up to your upper torso, covering your arms as well. As the orb lowers, feel your hands relaxing. Feel as your lungs expand, allowing more and more nourishing air into your body. Your breaths are now long and deep and fulfilling, bringing you even more comfort and peace. And finally, watch as the orb travels up to your head and neck. This time, as it lowers, it's not just releasing the tension in your shoulders, allowing them to fall away from your ears and relax. It is calming your mind. Feel as it unwinds any heavy thoughts in your brain and lays them out flat for you, allowing you to manage them with ease. Feel your jaw relax and the muscles around your ears calm. Then, as slowly as it drifted into the room, Watch as the orb drifts off. It heads back toward the window, illuminating the walls, ceiling, and floors as it moves. It illuminates every item on your nightstand in an entirely new way. And then, it's out the window and floating down the street, carrying that brilliant glow with it everywhere it goes. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find peace where we are, here and now, let us travel to ancient Greece and begin our story with the beloved, cunning king Theseus. Aegeus, the king of Athens, was a powerful, wise man. He lived in his lush palace with hardly a worry in the world. In the morning, he would sit in his palace atop the highest hill in the city, looking down at his subjects and the stunning port in the distance. He loved the way the rising sun painted the mountains on the horizon in breathtaking shades of scarlet, salmon, purple, and red. The way those mountains reflected on the water, 
looking almost too beautiful to truly be real. His palace had everything he could want, the best food in all of Athens, the most wonderful, talented musicians and performers, the finest furnishings that could be found anywhere in the world. He even had two beautiful wives, Meta and Chalciope, who he loved dearly. But there was one thing that was missing from the palace. The sound of children's feet scampering down the hall. The sound of children's laughter echoing through the art-covered walls, filling his heart and his home with warmth. Neither of King Aegeus's wives had yet bore him a child, and over time that became a grave concern of his. He worried that one of his three brothers would try to overthrow him and take the throne. So, Aegeus set out to try and find some guidance. Desperate for answers, he went to the oracle, hoping she would be able to tell him how to produce a male heir and with whom. The oracle looked down from her chair, glistening in the moonlight. She had a magical air about her that caused even King Aegeus to feel inferior. With a calm, relaxed tone, she told the king, Do not loosen the bulging mouth of the wineskin until you have reached the height of Athens, lest you die of grief. King Aegeus did not understand the oracle's words. Disappointed, he headed back to his kingdom, wondering if he would ever have a male heir. On the way back to Athens, he decided to stop at treason and consult King Pythias, hoping that he may be able to decipher the message from the oracle. King Pythias understood the message perfectly, but feigned ignorance, hoping that he could procure himself a grandson that had Aegeus's blood. He gave King Aegeus some wine to drink, and then introduced him to his daughter Aethra. They spent the night dancing and drinking and sitting under the stars and moon together. And, eventually, as the moon sailed toward the distant horizon, the two lay together. In her dream, Aethra received instructions from the goddess Athena to immediately go to the nearby island of Sveria so she left the sleeping Aegeus and waded across to the island. When she arrived, the mighty god Poseidon enchanted her and spent the night with her. So, when she later discovered she was pregnant, she didn't know who the father was. Was he a god or was he a king? Aegeus had worried something like this might happen. So, before he left treason, he hid his sword and a pair of his sandals beneath a great boulder. He went to Aethra and told her that if she bore a son, he could, when he reached adulthood, try and lift the boulder to retrieve the sword and sandals. If he managed to get the sword and sandals, then Aegeus would know he was truly his son. 
and he would be the future king of Athens. When Aethra gave birth to her son, Theseus, it was undeniable that he was the son of someone important. He was the most beautiful child anyone in treason had ever seen. He had a happy upbringing full of love, but it was clear from the beginning that Theseus was unlike his peers. One day, when Hercules came to visit and took off his lion belt before sitting at the table, all the children were alarmed, except for Theseus, who grabbed a heavy axe and swung it at the pelt, thinking it was a real lion. When he came of age, Aethra did as Aegeus had instructed. She brought her son to the boulder and told him that if he could lift the boulder and retrieve the sandals and sword, then he was to be the king of Athens. With ease, Theseus lifted the heavy boulder. Dust and pebbles rained down on him as he hoisted it over his head. When he pulled the sword into his hands and slipped on the sandals, he truly knew his identity. And not just that, he knew his destiny as well. Theseus set off on the road to Athens, which was not an easy route by any stretch of the imagination. His mother begged him to take a ship and sail over the sea to avoid the dangers that the wilderness around Athens held, but Theseus refused. He believed that to be king, he had to prove himself as a hero, or no one would respect him. He embraced the dangers that lay ahead, for he knew that he could handle them with ease, even if no one else could. And so, Theseus set out on foot in the sandals that his father had left for him before he was even born. The road ahead of him was, indeed, full of danger, but it was nothing that Theseus couldn't handle. As he walked through a peaceful glade in the forest, surrounded by the beautiful symphony of singing birds, Theseus felt at ease. He had never been this far from home before, but encountering a countryside this breathtaking made him feel as though he were at home. He listened to the sound of the chirping birds, the calls of frogs enjoying lazy days on lily pads floating on the glassy pond. But then, he heard another peculiar sound, a loud thump, thump, thump. Theseus knew exactly who it was before he even entered the glade. Periphetes was a legendary figure he had heard about since his childhood. A powerful warrior with the Browns Club, Periphetes took out anyone that dared to come near him. He had never been outsmarted and never lost a battle. But that would end on that beautiful, sunny afternoon with Theseus. Before Periphetes could even realize what was happening, Theseus snagged the bronze club from him. He defeated Periphetes with his own weapon and went on his way, deciding that the club would be a useful weapon 
on the rest of his journey, indeed. But it didn't stop there for Theseus. He defeated several rivals using their own methods. He took care of Cenis, the pine bender, who killed people by tying them to trees. Then he found himself on a stunning rocky road that wound along towery cliffs in Corinth. There, once more, Theseus felt at ease. He watched as seabirds swooped overhead and down into the waves. Wild flowers peppered the space between the road and the cliffs that overlooked the sea. Cottony clouds overhead cast lazy shadows on the evergreen grass around him. And then there was Siron, a strong, rough-looking man who seemed entirely out of place amongst all this beauty. They met on the narrow cliff face pathway where Siron told Theseus that he would not let him pass unless Theseus first washed his feet. Only then did Theseus realize who Siron was. He had heard tales of a thief, a scoundrel who would make travelers wash his feet, only to kick them into the waves below to be eaten by a giant turtle. But Theseus didn't want Siron to know that he was onto him. So Theseus knelt before Siron and took his foot as if to wash it. But instead of washing it, Theseus hoisted Siron over his head and tossed him into the waves below, sending him to meet the fate that he had intended for Theseus. After defeating Siron, Theseus continued along the dangerous route to Athens. Every single rival that he came upon, he was able to overpower or outsmart with ease. And not only was he protecting himself, but he was bringing peace for any travelers that would walk the once troubled road behind him. When he arrived in Athens, he thought he would be seen as a hero, the heir to the throne who was finally coming to take his rightful place. However, that was not the case. Theseus didn't reveal his identity to his father when he arrived at the palace, so his father had no clue who this young warrior truly was. But Medea, one of his father's wives, knew instantly who Theseus was. She had a son from a previous marriage that she hoped would ascend to the throne. So instead of welcoming Theseus and greeting him with kindness, she told him he needed to prove his worth. To achieve this, she ordered him to capture the Marathonian bull, which was once captured by Hercules and later let loose around Marathon. She believed it to be an impossible task, but few things were impossible for Theseus. He set off to Marathon, where the bull had been terrorizing locals and causing havoc for several years. With ease, Theseus was able to capture and conquer the bull. The people of Marathon celebrated Theseus as a hero, and he relished in the glory of not only saving the people, but proving his worth yet again. 
When Theseus returned to Athens to tell Medea and his father that he had conquered the bull, his father was pleased. Medea, on the other hand, was far from it. She proposed a toast, giving Theseus a poisoned chalice. But just as Theseus was about to drink from the cup, his father recognized the sandals and the sword he was carrying and realized who he was. He knocked the chalice from Theseus's hands and embraced his son, welcoming him home. Medea fled the palace, never to return. Finally, Theseus was where he belonged in Athens. And though living in Athens was glorious, it was not easy. Many people wanted to kill Theseus for a chance to ascend to the throne. And there was one other problem, a problem that Theseus could and would not stand for. King Minos of Crete had once sent his most beloved son, Androgeus, to take part in the Panathenaic Games that were held every four years in Athens. Androgeus soon became a crowd favorite, which angered Palantidas, the sons of King Aegeus's younger brother. Palantidas killed Androgeus, devastating King Minos. As a result, King Minos ordered that every great year, which occurred after every seven cycles on the solar calendar, King Aegeus was to send his seven most courageous men and seven most beautiful women to be thrown into the labyrinth in Crete and destroyed by the Minotaur. Theseus disapproved of this horrible ritual. He wanted to protect the people of Athens, and so he set out himself to defeat the Minotaur and put an end to the madness. When he landed on the stunning shores of Crete, there was a woman sitting on the dock, twirling her feet in the cool water below. Her name was Ariadne, and she was the most beautiful woman in all of Crete. She was also the daughter of King Minos, the man who had cursed so many people of Athens to their horrible fate. But when their eyes met for the first time, nothing else mattered. Where they were from and who their parents were was lost in the wind. All Ariadne could do was stare up at Theseus. Her heart pounded as she admired his deep, honey-amber eyes. Her eyes traced along his sharp jaw and journeyed down to his muscles, which shimmered in the light of the slowly setting sun. She could see the power he possessed the glory that he was constantly chasing after. She was mesmerized by him, and Theseus felt the same. So rarely did he have time to stop and truly see the people around him. But with Ariadne, it was impossible not to. She twirled her feet in the water and looked out over the sunset with such a calm, peaceful energy, it nearly made Theseus forget why he had come here in the first place. They walked toward one another as if they were drawn by a powerful enchantment. They talked on the shore there for quite some time. 
Theseus helped her up with a kind hand, and as their fingers brushed together, sparks seemed to ignite in the air between them. He watched the reflection of the sunset in her bright green eyes as the sun crept further and further toward the horizon. He was utterly transfixed by her, drawn to her in a way that he had not been drawn to anyone else before. Their conversation lasted for quite some time, and when Theseus finally revealed why he had come to Crete, Ariadne was overcome with a wave of worry. She knew how fearsome the Minotaur was, and even if Theseus defeated the Minotaur, he would surely be lost in the labyrinth that had been masterfully created by Daedalus. Wanting the man she was falling for to escape the labyrinth, Ariadne went to Daedalus, hoping to discover the secret of his maze. She spoke to him for hours next to a crackling fire, desperate to get an answer out of him somehow, some way. Finally, Daedalus gave in. He could see the resilience of Ariadne and the strength of her love for Theseus. He told Ariadne that one could escape his ever-changing maze if they brought a thread and made a trail behind them, which they could then follow back out when needed. Ariadne was overjoyed with this news. She hurried to the side of Theseus and gave him a large spool of red thread. As she placed it in his hands, her eyes locked with his. She knew that this thread would keep him safe and would bring him back to her. She told Theseus to lay a trail of thread behind him as he made his way to the center of the maze. Theseus thanked Ariadne profusely. Even someone as wise as him would not have thought such a simple trick could be the difference between surviving the maze and not. And so, Ariadne led Theseus to the maze. Despite where they were going, it was a light-hearted journey together. Both of them were so grateful to have found one another that the weight of what lay ahead was nowhere to be found. When they finally reached the stone edge of the impossibly tall maze, Ariadne patted the thread in Theseus's hands. She smiled at him, making him promise to come back, and wishing him luck in defeating the Minotaur. Theseus looked into Ariadne's beautiful eyes and promised that if he came out, he would take Ariadne away with him to spend their lives together. With that sweet promise, Theseus looked upon the maze. He took a deep breath and entered, dropping the scarlet thread behind him so he could find his way back when the time finally came. Walking through the maze was a challenging ordeal. The stone corridor seemed endless, and the sky overhead was a hazy gray. But Theseus did not despair. 
he knew that he had Ariadne waiting for him on the other side, and he knew that by doing this, he was protecting his people. No more would the great people of Athens be sacrificed for the anger of one king. He walked deeper and deeper still into the winding maze, until finally he found himself approaching a large atrium, and lying there in the middle, curled up fast asleep, was none other than the fearsome Minotaur. Theseus thought he had the best luck out of any of the warriors. The Minotaur was asleep, an easy target. But the moment he stepped into the atrium, the Minotaur awakened. He snapped to his feet, towering over Theseus. Theseus tightened his grip on his club and the sword his father had given him all those years ago. The battle was fierce yet short. Theseus glided around the Minotaur with ease and grace, allowing him to get out without a single scrape. Finally, he knocked the Minotaur to the ground, defeating him. In that single powerful strike, the future of Athens' maidens and warriors was secured. They were safe. With the Minotaur defeated, Theseus could set out to achieve his next goal. He could take the beautiful Ariadne as his wife. He tugged on the red string with a faint smile on his face, knowing that soon she would be in his arms. The journey to get out of the labyrinth somehow seemed longer than the journey in. All Theseus could think about was Ariadne waiting on the other side, probably praying for his safe return. The red thread slid through his fingers as he wound it in over and over, making good progress through the maze. In all the gray and darkness of the maze, there was that bright red thread of hope, that thread that reminded him why he had done this in the first place, so that all the people who would have been sacrificed to Crete would be able to remain with their loved ones, so no one would lose their Ariadne. Finally, he felt a cool breeze wash over him. He knew the exit of the maze must be close. He picked up the pace, allowing the emotions inside him to guide him more and more, until finally he emerged into the dawn of the day. The smell of wildflowers and cypress trees and the fresh, beautiful ocean washed over him immediately. And then, before he even saw her, he felt Ariadne's arms around him. She giggled with glee as she hugged her beloved, holding him tightly as if she never wanted to let go. Theseus kissed her forehead and looked at her with a warm smile. He promised her that now they would be wed, just as he had said before he entered the maze. After all this, they could be together. Neither of them could wait for the wedding, 
and so they didn't. Theseus took Ariadne by the hand and led her back to the camp they had established, where all the other Athenians awaited them. When Theseus announced that he and Ariadne would be wed, the small crowd erupted with joyful applause. They were thrilled to see their hero in love with someone like Ariadne. As the sun rose around them, painting the sea behind them in a watercolor of pinks, oranges, reds, purples, and yellows, Theseus and Ariadne took one another by the hands. They stared deeply into one another's eyes as their vows were read before the gods. Standing there, they thought about how truly strange fate is, how just a few short days ago they hadn't known one another, how their kingdoms had detested one another, and now here they were, hand in hand, telling anyone that would listen about the love they had for one another. And, indeed, they truly had a lot of love for one another. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Remember that any time you are struggling, you can follow this red thread to a night of rest. Please join us again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello. And welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to the coasts of ancient Greece to explore the tale of Jason and the Argonauts on their nearly impossible quest to retrieve the Golden Fleece. We'll observe Jason's childhood in the serene Mount Pelion in northern Greece. Ison didn't have much in the world. Once, he had been free to roam the beautiful landscape of Thessaly. He could meander through the meadows as the flower-tinged breeze washed over him, revitalizing him and reminding him of the beauty that could be found in nature. He could look up at the towering cliffs and rock faces, marveling at their height and grandeur. When he was younger, the world was full of potential for him, and his future was bright. But the lure of power and the quest for it was constantly on the minds of the people of ancient Greece at the time. And Ison's half-brother, Peleus, certainly had it on his mind quite a lot. Desperate for the throne, desperate to be the king of Eoclus, Peleus did all that he could to assure no one stood in his way. Peleus banished his other brother and half-brother, sending them to faraway territories where they would be unable to interfere with Peleus' quest for power. But Peleus didn't trust that if he banished Ison, he would stay away. 
So, instead, he decided to keep Ison close by and keep an eye on him. One day, Ison awakened to moonlight streaming across his bed. Guards entered along with his brother, who looked down at him with a tense, serious expression. He told his brother that only one of them could rule, and it was going to be him. Ison knew that such a thing was on the horizon, but he didn't think that Peleus would do it so soon. Within minutes, the guards had Ison by the arms and were dragging him down into the caves beneath the city, where he would be imprisoned for the rest of his life. Ison spent years in prison, and though it was, indeed, a prison, he was not alone. The caves had become a sort of city, a sort of refuge for those who were unlucky enough to have met the wrath of Peleus. They were a fairly bleak place, and yet, even within them, light could be found. The granite walls were often blanketed in a thick carpet of evergreen moss that glistened in what little sunlight made its way through the stone corridors. The caves smelled brilliantly of soil, loam, and the salty sea, whose invigorating aroma was swept in through caves that peppered the seaside cliffs of Eoclus, and Ison made a life for himself there. They were imprisoned, but he was not one to go silently into the night. And within that system of caves that had slowly become his home, he met someone who truly was the light he had been searching for. Her name was al Samidi, and she was a beacon of hope in the darkness of the cave. The first time Ison talked to her, the words flowed out of his mouth, surprising himself. He felt utterly connected to her in a way that he had never thought possible. It was as if their souls had been searching for each other for quite some time. And when they met, all felt right in the world, in spite of where they were within it. It didn't take long for the two to become husband and wife. They held a little ceremony in the caves, believing in their hearts that the gods and goddesses of Greece were looking upon them with kindness. Their happiness and joy became even greater when Alcimede fell pregnant with a child. She welcomed her baby boy into the world with a vibrant smile on her face and a heart that was swelling with love. She named the son Jason, and from the moment his parents laid eyes on him, they loved him and cherished him like the little miracle that he was. But there was a problem that weighed heavily on their minds. If Peleus knew that Ison had had a child, he would do all that he could to stop the child from surviving into adulthood. Jason was a threat to Peleus, a potential heir to the throne 
that he had worked so hard to secure for himself. And so, when he heard that Ison's son had been delivered, Peleus raced down into the caves to see for himself. But what he saw when he arrived were several women surrounding Alcimide and Jason, sobbing loudly about the child who hadn't survived birth. Peleus felt at ease, believing that there was no threat to his throne. But, indeed, there was. Sensing the danger that Jason was in, Alcimide had called for the other women, trapped within the caves, to come to her side and pretend that the child had been lost in order to protect him. And the protection didn't stop there. That night, Ison and Alcimide cuddled their son in the moonlight. They looked at his perfect nose, at all his picture-perfect fingers and toes, and they felt a kind of bliss they had never experienced. But deep within their hearts, they knew this bliss would be short-lived. They could not keep Jason with them, They could not raise their darling son in this cave prison, and they could not let Peleus know that he was alive at all. And so, they did what they knew they had to do. The very next morning, as the sun began to rise over the beautiful coastal city, Alcimide took her son to one of the exits of the cave that overlooked the ocean. The sun splashed across the waves, illuminating them in a pink and gold glow that made Alcimide feel hopeful, in spite of what she and Ison had come there to do. At the edge of the water there on that bright new day, Chiron, a centaur, awaited her. He was known by people across Greece for being the wisest and most just centaur to have ever lived. If Alcimide was going to give up her darling boy, She wanted him to be with someone that would raise him well, someone who could pass down good lessons to him and fill his head with kindness and knowledge. And Chiron was the perfect fit. He was known by people to be a good mentor to the youths, a father figure to several of them throughout history. Chiron took the young child in his arms and gave Alcimide and Ison an encouraging smile. He promised to keep their son safe and to ensure that when the time was right, he was ready to come back and be with his family. With that, Chiron set off to his home with young Jason on his back. To Chiron's surprise, Jason did not cry. He did not make a sound. He stared at the clouds and the trees as they whipped on by in a soothing flurry of color and texture. It was as if the baby knew that this was what was right for him, that this would allow his future to unfold as it was destined to. And so, 
Jason spent his childhood with Chiron, high atop a mountain. It was a beautiful and happy home, the kind of home that many people dream about. In the mornings, Jason would awaken to the sounds of the mountain birds singing their soothing song to the universe. He would make his way to the river and wash up, allowing that brisk water to course down over his well-rested body, infusing him with a newfound energy and the promise of the day. Then, he would spend the morning wandering the fields. Often, he would bring a loaf of bread and a few slices of cheese with him. He would meander through the meadows full of flowers, gazing around in awe at the beautiful world around him. He had always felt connected to nature, had always felt in touch with it. So being raised out in the wilderness like this, far away from any cities or any corrupt leaders vying for a throne, just felt right. By midday, Jason would sit down with Chiron and any other students that were cycling through under Chiron's mentorship. Chiron taught him everything he needed to know about the world. He taught him about survival, about cooking, about art, about music, about combat about politics and philosophy. By the end of every lesson, Jason would practically have stars in his eyes. Chiron was a being who truly understood the world, for both its beauty, its sorrows, and its potential. Learning from him was like learning from an all-knowing God. Jason spent all of his childhood learning from Chiron, and he never tired of hearing him speak. His childhood was the best anyone could ask for, a childhood full of knowledge, exploration, acceptance, and understanding. When Jason finally entered adulthood, he couldn't have been more prepared for what lay ahead. He had known from a young age that he was the son of Ison, that he could one day claim the throne of Eoclus for himself and redeem his father. And soon, he was ready to take that journey. He was strong enough, wise enough. He had proven himself in several battles, tasks, and trials, and Chiron knew that he could no longer keep him in the mountain refuge. Jason was an adult. Jason was ready to become the king of Ioclus. But, back in Ioclus, Peleus had been concerned for quite some time. Even though he believed that Ison and Alcimides' child had died, there were still some worries dancing around in the back of his head. He was no longer a fighter. He could not battle for his throne nor did he want to. To soothe his fears, he called upon an oracle to tell him the truth, to tell him if his concerns were at all warranted. 
the oracle sat before him, cloaked in a long, purple robe with a serious look in her eyes. She carried a mystical energy about her. She closed her eyes as the messages about the future and the past washed over her in a powerful wave. And then she told Peleus what he needed to hear. It wasn't exactly what he wanted to hear, but it was something that could guide him. She warned Peleus that he needed to beware of a man wearing one sandal. Peleus informed all of his guards and confidants about this, ensuring that he would be alerted if such a man was to arrive. And, on his long quest back to his homeland, back to Eoclus, Jason did, indeed, lose a sandal. He was on a mission to return to Eoclus as quickly as possible, but the terrain was challenging. Just as he was approaching the city, as he could see it glistening in the far distance, Jason found himself standing before a river. The water churned over the rocks at frightening speed, kicking up a dewy gossamer that soaked his cloak and his hair. Jason could charge across the river and be in Ioclus easily, but there was something that stopped him, standing on the edge of the river, looking across with a forlorn expression, was an old woman. She hunched over a walking stick as she wobbled toward the water. Jason knew there was no way this woman could cross a river of this magnitude, certainly not at her age. Though he wanted to continue on to Ioclus, his conscience wouldn't allow him to without offering his help to this old woman. He approached her and offered his help, which she gratefully accepted. He scooped the woman up in his arms and carried her across the river, feeling the icy chill of the water splashing against his legs. Finally, they reached the other side, only for Jason to realize he had lost one sandal along the way. The woman thanked Jason, who assured her it was no problem, but there was something unusual about this old woman. She wasn't an old woman at all. A shimmer surrounded her, causing Jason to shield his eyes from the incredible golden glow. When he was finally able to blink away the blurriness in his vision, he realized who was standing before him. The old woman was actually the goddess Hera in disguise. She revealed herself to Jason, thanking him for his kindness and patience. A surge of warmth washed over Jason when Hera raised her hands. She told the young man that he had been blessed for his kindness and that he would certainly need that blessing moving forward. Jason continued on the road to Ioclus, feeling empowered by his encounter with Hera. And though he was missing a sandal, he did not care. 
he entered the city where he had been born, the city that should have been under his father's rule, the city that should be under his rule now. Immediately upon entering the city, Peleus' guards spotted Jason, the man with one sandal. They knew as soon as their eyes laid on him that Jason was different. He was the one that the oracle had warned Peleus about. The guards flocked to Peleus' side to tell him what they had seen. Peleus had known this was coming for quite some time, and he had come up with a rather interesting solution to his problem. Jason went straight to Peleus' throne room. He was not there to surprise Peleus or try to wrestle his throne from him by any nefarious means. Instead, he simply told Peleus why he had come. As the son of Ison, Jason was the rightful heir to the throne, and now Jason was here to claim it. Peleus listened to Jason's words, fiddling with his fingers against the arm of his throne. He was not going to argue with Jason, nor was he going to deny him the throne. Instead, he told Jason something rather surprising. He told him that the throne was all Jason's. As long as Jason could retrieve the Golden Fleece. The Golden Fleece was a much sought-after item in ancient Greece. The beautiful fleece was that of a golden-wooled winged ram named Chrysomelus, whose fleece was glowing with matted skeins of gold. The fleece represented power, royalty, and fame in ancient Greece. It was something that only a true king would possess. And if Jason was to be a true king, he would have to claim it for himself. The problem was, the Golden Fleece was far, far away from Eoclus, across a treacherous sea in Colchis, with dozens of obstacles in the way. And once Jason would arrive at Colchis, where the fleece could be found, it wouldn't be the end of his journey. The fleece belonged to the kind of Colchis, a man who would surely not let it go without a fight. But Jason wanted to take the throne more than anything, not just for himself, but for his father, to right the wrong that had been inflicted on his family all those years ago. So, he did all that he could to ensure he would make the journey and retrieve the fleece. He assembled a team of powerful heroes, heroes who were well known across Greece for their strength, their noble deeds, and their power. Heroes like Heracles, Orpheus, and Acastus. The crew all sailed aboard the Argo, one of the finest ships ever made. They dubbed themselves the Argonauts, taking the name from the ship itself. When the day came for them all to set sail, they waved goodbye to the people waiting on the shore and set off across the sea. The sea full of magic, mystery, and struggles. But Jason was not afraid. He knew that Chiron had raised him well, 
and he knew how badly he wanted to uphold the task that had been given to him when he was a newborn. He was going to reclaim the throne. The journey to find Colchis was a long one, and there were several stops along the way for the heroes. They settled on the island of Lemnos for quite some time, an island full of women who had been abandoned by their husbands. The women swarmed the Argonauts, and for several months the men enjoyed the women's company, fathering children with them and keeping them company day in and day out as the sun rose and set on the island. Heracles, however, did not partake in this behavior and urged the heroes to continue onward toward the horizon to find Colchis no matter what it took. One day, the heroes found themselves in the court of Phineas of Salmodesius. The poor man had been cursed by Zeus to have harpies, which were half human and half bird, steal any food that was put out for Phineas, and as a result, Phineas was starving. Feeling pity for the poor man, Jason slayed the harpies that were stealing his food, allowing him to eat and be well again. Grateful for Jason's help, Phineas revealed a secret to him. There was a single passage to the Black Sea coast where Colchis was located and it was fraught with trouble. The clashing rocks were a pair of rocks at the Bosporus that formed a narrow, natural strait leading to the Black Sea. These two massive rocks would collide against one another any time that a ship passed between them. Jason and the Argonauts knew that passing between the clashing rocks would mean trouble, but they didn't realize how easy it would be to make it through with one simple trick. Phineas told them that when approaching the clashing rocks, all they had to do was release a single dove. If the dove made it through the rocks, then they were to hurry and also pass through. But if the dove did not make it, their passage through the rocks would be ill-fated as well. The Argonauts reached the clashing rocks aboard the Argo and released a stunning white dove. They held their breath as the dove flew through the rocks and emerged on the other side unharmed. They rode with all their might, making it through the rocks themselves. Soon after, they finally reached Colchis. The city along the water was stunning, bathed in the glow of sunlight radiating off calm sea waves. However, the king within the city was far from calm. When Jason demanded the golden fleece from him, the king told him he would have to complete three tasks to earn the golden fleece. First, Jason had to plow a field with fire-breathing oxen that would surely burn him to a crisp. Then, he had to sow dragon teeth into the soil. Then, he had to overcome a sleepless dragon to retrieve the golden fleece. Jason was uncharacteristically defeated by these tasks. He had come all this way, and still, 
he felt that the fleece was further away than ever. However, still remembering his heroic act of helping her cross the river, Hera smiled down on Jason. She worked with Aphrodite to make Medea, the daughter of the king of Colchis, fall in love with Jason. Medea was instantly enamored with Jason and worked with him to ensure that he could overcome the tasks her father had set for him. First, she created a balm for Jason that protected him from the flames of the fire-breathing oxen. As he walked along, plowing the field, not a single flame brushed his skin or burnt him. Then, she warned him of what the dragon teeth would become. As soon as Jason planted them, they would sprout into spartoi, meaning sown men, skeleton-like army of warriors, fierce in battle. But Jason was prepared, for Medea had warned him of Spartoi's existence and of how to defeat them. He simply threw a rock at the horde of Spartoi. Unable to find where the blow came from, the warriors attacked one another. Jason didn't have to land a single hit. Finally, it came time to get the golden fleece from the sleepless dragon, perhaps the most challenging task of all. But Jason was well prepared. Medea gave him a herb potion that would cause the dragon to sleep. With one simple spray, the dragon fell into a powerful slumber. Jason grabbed the brilliant golden fleece from him. The weight and beauty of the fleece in his hands was nearly enough to bring him to tears. He and Medea set sail for Eoclus, where Jason would finally be the king. They threw a festive celebration for Jason's return and to celebrate his accomplishment. By that time, Jason's father was frail and old, wanting to celebrate with him, wanting to see that all those years were worth it. Jason begged Medea to take some years of his own life and give them to his father. With powerful magic she possessed, Medea did just that, revitalizing Ison and allowing him to reunite wholly and fully with his son. The two looked over the city with Medea by their side, knowing that all the hope they had held, the promise of a bright future, it was all for a good reason. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, relaxing sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Chris, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to the beautiful land of ancient Greece, where we will join Heracles, also known as Hercules in Roman mythology, on his heroic quest to complete the famous Twelve Labors. It was a sunny, brilliant day in the 
plains of central Greece when young Heracles was born. From the moment he entered the world, it was clear that he possessed something special. He smiled at his darling mother, Alcmene. Mere moments after he was delivered, and there was a spark in his eyes, unlike anything she had ever seen. She cradled her son in her arms, promising to keep him safe and happy. But little did she know how challenging that would prove to be. Heracles was the illegitimate son of Zeus, the god of the sky and thunder. Zeus was married to Hera, the goddess of women, marriage, and family. When Hera discovered that Heracles had been born, her jealousy and pain got the best of her. Her husband Zeus often strayed, but when these affairs resulted in children, they made it harder for her to forget these transgressions and potentially put her life and the lives of all those in Greece in danger. And so, led by jealousy and revenge, Hera sent two snakes into Heracles' crib when he was but an infant. She knew a child as young as he would be unable to protect himself. At least, a normal child would be unable to. Still an infant, Heracles looked upon the snakes with no fear. Instead of cowering or crying, instead of calling out for his mother, Heracles took the snakes in his tiny hands, squeezing them and preventing them from biting him. Hera was disgusted, heartbroken by this, and she was concerned. It was clear this baby had strength of the gods, strength that would be hard to rid the world of. For several years, Hera allowed Heracles to go on and live his life peacefully. He was raised by his mother in the serene countryside. He spent his days doing chores around the household and being friendly with the other townspeople. He was known for his strength and his kindness, and because of both of those, he was a great help to all the people of his town. Some people whispered that he was the child of a god, but Heracles never spoke of his lineage, instead focusing on living every present moment to the fullest. When he was just a young adult, he fell madly in love with a woman named Megara. The two were wed at a local temple and lived a peaceful, happy life together for several years. They spent long days out in the sunshine together working in their fields, and spent their nights curled up by the fire together, swapping stories and marveling at the vast skies full of stars twinkling above them. But Hera, perched up in the palace of Olympus, in a room of marble and gold, was still displeased and concerned about Heracles. Her jealousy 
had not diminished after all these years. And so, she did the unthinkable. She cast a spell upon poor Heracles, driving him mad. In his insanity, he ended the life of his beloved wife. And when he awakened from the spell that Hera had put him under, he was devastated. Heracles did not care how this fate had come about. He firmly placed the blame upon himself. Desperate to repent for his actions, he knelt beneath the willow tree at the edge of the home that he had shared with his wife, clasped his hands together, praying to the god Apollo. He asked Apollo for guidance. Unsure of how to move forward, unsure of how he could repent for such actions, Apollo looked upon Heracles with an air of sorrow. He knew the young man did not mean to do this. He knew he never would have done it without Hera's influence. And yet, he knew there was only one way of mending the wrong that he had been forced to do. Apollo called down to Heracles with a calm, comforting voice, telling him that he should speak to the oracle of Delphi. Heracles thanked the god wholeheartedly and began his journey to visit the oracle. Tucked away in a temple, she provided guidance for the gods and for the whole of Greece. Her wisdom and foresight was unmatched, and Heracles felt great comfort knowing that he was in good hand seeking her guidance. He knelt before the oracle of Delphi. Around them, candles crackled in the dark temple and fragrant offerings of flowers and incense lined the walls. Heracles knelt before the oracle and asked her for guidance. The oracle placed a hand upon the hero's shoulder, feeling deeply for him. Hera's quest for vengeance was no secret and everyone knew that Heracles' deed was not his fault. Still, the oracle told him that he would have to repent, and to repent, he would have to serve Eurystheus, the king of Tyrans, for twelve whole years. When Heracles knelt before Eurystheus to repent for his crimes. He had no idea what kind of road awaited him. Eurystheus had twelve tasks prepared for Heracles, one for each year. Only, these were not average tasks. These tasks were seen by everyone at the time as impossible to complete. They had never been successfully accomplished by anyone, and many had passed on in their attempts to complete them. But Heracles, fearing no man and fearing no task, agreed to do this for Eurystheus with no hesitation. Though he knew the twelve tasks would be challenging, 
he also knew that completing them would allow him to atone for the loss of his beloved wife and his own actions. Eurystheus told Heracles of his first task, to bring him the pelt of a lion that had been terrorizing the hills around the town of Nemea. Heracles set out on the task, carrying nothing but a club and a bow and arrow with him. The sight of Nemea was breathtaking. Mountains encased it. Mountains coated in golden grasses that swayed and danced in the wind. There were sprawling meadows of wildflowers that filled the air with a calming fragrance. Heracles wished he could sit beneath the shade of a tree and enjoy the beauty of the day. But he knew the task he faced was great. Heracles tracked the footsteps of the lion through the stunning countryside of Nemea. Every step of the way through the winding hills seemed to pass a view more beautiful than the last. He breezed by stunning caves made of blue and silver and grey stone that sparkled in the sunlight. He passed by flower meadow after flower meadow, stopping every once in a while just to breathe in their aroma. He passed by trickling streams, streams where the lion had paused to sip the cool mountain water. Finally, Heracles' tracking led him to the lion. He reached into his quiver and pulled out the arrows, getting a good shot of the beast. But as the arrow reached the lion, nothing happened. It crashed to the ground, falling in the dirt as though it was nothing but a piece of paper he had thrown. The beast roared at Heracles, aware of what he was trying to do. Heracles understood why getting rid of the lion had been deemed impossible. Its golden fur was impervious to attack. Instead, Heracles grabbed hold of his club and followed behind the lion until the lion entered a cave with two entrances. The cave was tall and majestic, with large rocks crumbled around it. Rocks that had been there since the earth shifted thousands and thousands of years before, knowing this was his one chance to trap the lion. Heracles piled rocks in front of one of the entrances. Then he followed the lion into the other giving it no escape. Using nothing but his bare hands, Heracles was able to put an end to the lion that had been terrorizing the people of Nemea for months on end. After being presented with the lion's pelt, the king was shocked. Before this, he had not really grasped the sheer strength of Heracles. Fearful of that strength, the king forbade Heracles 
from ever entering his city again. Instead of facing him face to face, Eurystheus would send Heracles his tasks with the help of a herald. And that is precisely how he sent Heracles on his next task, which was even more challenging than the first. Heracles was sent to defeat the Hydra, a massive, snake-like creature with nine heads that dwelled in the swamps of Lerna. The snake would rise from the swamps in the moonlight and terrorize the countryside, forcing many people to stay in their homes. Heracles traveled to the beautiful countryside and entered one of the many swamps. Moss hung from the trees that rose high overhead casting shadows on the murky swamp water. He knew the task before him would be almost impossible to complete, which is why he was thankful to have his nephew, Aeolus, alongside him. Heracles lured the Hydra from its den using flaming arrows. Then, once it was finally out to face them, the two worked together to take the beast down. Heracles buried the final immortal head of the Hydra underground beneath a heavy rock, ensuring that it wouldn't be able to torment anyone ever again. With that task completed, Heracles met with a herald who told him of his next task. He was to capture the Golden Hind of Artemis. He had to travel to Serenia and return with the hide, enormous female deer with golden antlers, hooves of bronze, which was also exceptionally fast and snorted fire. At first, it seemed as though this would be an easy task. Surely, someone as strong as Heracles could get a deer. However, the reality of the situation was much more complicated. The deer was sacred to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Wilderness, nature, vegetation, and the moon. If Heracles simply killed the deer to bring it to the king, he would have to endure the wrath of Artemis. Not wanting this fate, Heracles realized he would have to capture the deer alive and bring it to the king. For a long year, Heracles followed the deer everywhere she went, chasing her. After such a long time, the beautiful deer became weary, wanting a place to rest. She wandered to the lush mountains and prepared to cross a stream. Realizing he may lose the deer if she crossed the stream, and exhausted after a year-long journey, Heracles shot the deer with an arrow. Artemis became enraged and immediately visited Heracles demanding repentance for the death of her beloved pet. Heracles had no choice 
but to tell Artemis of his task. When she heard what the poor hero had to endure, she was able to forgive him. She healed the wound on her deer and allowed Heracles to take the deer to the king to complete his task. The next task the king had for Heracles was equally challenging, maybe even more so. High on the mountain of Erymanthus, there lived a boar. This boar was a beast of an animal, with long tasks and a bad temperament. Every morning, it would race down from its den at the mountain's peak. Using its tasks, it would destroy everything in its path, destroying homes and wagons and hurting anyone that dared come near him. Heracles' task was to bring the boar back to the king, alive. So, he traveled high into those mountains, where the peak was blanketed with a thick layer of white snow. Below, the mountainside was lush, vibrant with the greens and yellows and browns of a flourishing forest. Heracles could hear the beast almost the moment he stepped on the mountaintop. It was rooting around in the soil, looking for something to eat. Heracles took chase, forcing the boar into the forest where it hid from the mighty Heracles. It ducked into the thicket, hoping the hero would go away. Instead, Heracles poked at it in the thicket, forcing the boar to run into the snow. Trapped by the thick, cold snow, Heracles was able to quickly scoop the boar up in a net and carry it back to the king's herald. His next task was the first that didn't involve facing a fearsome beast. Rather, it was a seemingly simple task with the intention to humiliate the great hero. Heracles was ordered to clean King Orgius's stables. King Orgius was an extremely wealthy man with the greatest number of cattle in the country, gifted to him by his father, the god Helios. But this task was harder than it seemed, since the stables were huge and never cleaned before, and he had only a single day to complete the task. Nevertheless, using his strength, Heracles dug long ditches that laced through and around the stables and managed to reroute two nearby rivers to wash the ditches and stables clean. Seeing the ease at which Heracles completed this task, the king decided to give him a more challenging task next. He was ordered to drive away a massive flock of Stymphalian birds that were terrorizing a forest near Lake Stymphalia. Heracles made his way through the thick forest to reach the sparkling lake. But just as he reached the lake, the shadow of birds with beaks of bronze and sharp 
metallic feathers swept over him. Heracles had never seen a flock so big, and he had no idea how to drive them away. Fortunately for him, the goddess Athena saw his dilemma and decided to offer a young hero some help. She descended from Olympus and presented him with a crotala, a noise-making clapper. This crotala had been forged by none other than Hephaestus, the god of fire, metalworking, and forges, ensuring that they would be loud enough to drive the birds away. Heracles made his way to the tallest peak above the lake. He clapped the crotala together, driving the birds out of the trees. Heracles then shot many of them with feathered arrows tipped with poisonous blood from the slain Hydra. Heracles' seventh task was to capture the Cretan bull, a bull with a rather dark history on the island of Crete, and the father of famed Minotaur. The strong bull had caused trouble for the people of Crete for a long time. But Heracles was able to take down the beast with relative ease. When he arrived on the island, he first sought permission from King Minos to take the bull away. Then he captured the beast in a headlock wrestling it to the ground, and then shipped him to Eurystheus. The bull later broke loose and wandered into Marathon, becoming known as the Marathonian Bull. His next task would prove to be far more challenging. Heracles was sent to gather the man-eating mares of Diomedes. Diomedes was the leader of a Thracian tribe, and he used the power of his mares to rule over them. Eager to complete his task, Heracles sailed across the sea to gather the mares with a group of volunteers. They managed to gather the mares and drive them back towards their ship. But not without Diomedes discovering what they had done. Desperate to have his mares back, Diomedes chased after Heracles and his team, stealing back the mares. A fight ensued which Heracles easily won with his strength. He defeated the tribe and killed Diomedes, allowing him to escape with the mares and complete his task. Bucephalus, Alexander the Great's beloved horse, was said to be descended from these mares. His ninth task was to obtain the belt of Hippolyta, the queen of the Amazon. The belt was a powerful armor crafted by her father, god Ares, god of war himself. The Amazons were a group of powerful female warriors and hunters who allowed no men in their society. When Heracles and his crew got off the ship, he kindly told Hippolyta 
why they had come. Hippolyta agreed to give Heracles her belt, feeling sorry for the warrior and wanting him to find peace. But there was one person on the island who didn't want peace at all. Hera, disguised as an Amazon woman, told the other warriors that the ship was attempting to kidnap their queen. Enraged, the warriors raced towards the ship, ready for a fight. A great battle ensued between the warriors and Heracles. He finally managed to escape on his ship with the belt, though it was no easy task. Heracles' next labor would bring him to the farthest point he had ever journeyed to. He was ordered to go to the ends of the earth and obtain the cattle of the monster Geryon. Heracles sailed to the beautiful faraway island, and as soon as he arrived, he was attacked by Orthrus, a giant two-headed dog, the father of the Sphinx and the Nemean lion. Heracles fought Orthrus, alerting Gideon to his presence. Fighting a giant with three heads and six arms was a challenge. But Heracles had an advantage with his strength. Using his poisoned arrows, Heracles was able to knock down Geryon and take his cattle. When he presented the cattle to the king, he felt a wave of relief. His tasks were nearly finished. The eleventh task presented to Heracles brought him to one of the most beautiful places on earth. He was ordered to get three golden apples from the Garden of Hesperides. The apples were guarded by a dragon as well as the Hesperides, the daughters of the Titan Atlas. And not only that, but the apples themselves belonged to Hera and Zeus. Heracles managed to find the garden with the help of the old man of the sea, a shape-shifting sea god. When he arrived, he discovered Atlas holding up the sky on his shoulders. Atlas had been condemned to hold the sky above his head for all of his life, a task which he rightfully hated. Seeing this as an opportunity, Heracles offered to hold the heavens for Atlas if he would retrieve the apples. Thrilled to be rid of the weight, Atlas agreed. Heracles held the heavens above his head while he waited for Atlas to return. But when Atlas returned, he was eager to find a way to trick Heracles into holding the sky forever for him. He offered to bring the apples to the gods instead. Knowing this was a trick, Heracles agreed and gave Atlas a trick of his own. He agreed to continue holding the heavens but asked if Atlas could take it back for just a moment so he could put some padding on his shoulders. As soon as Atlas took hold of the sky again, 
Heracles took the apples and raced off, leaving him there. Heracles' final task would bring him somewhere he had never been before, Underworld. There, he was ordered to capture Cerberus, the three-headed dog that guarded the gates of the Underworld. Heracles asked Hades, the god of the Underworld, for permission to bring Cerberus to the king. Hades agreed, on the condition that Heracles not kill the beast. With ease, Heracles fought Cerberus and slung him over his shoulder, still alive. He brought Cerberus to the king, completing his tasks after twelve long years. From that moment forward, Heracles was forgiven for what Hera had made him do. He lived the rest of his life as a hero, sailing on many adventures with other heroes in Greek mythology. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we travel to ancient Greece, where we will unwind with the romantic story of unconditional love. The story of Odysseus and Penelope, the king and queen of Ithaca. Penelope awakened to the sound of birds chirping in the treetops, hanging over the river that laced through the countryside beside her house. It was the same thing she woke up to nearly every morning. First, she would feel the warmth of the sun bleeding through the glass window pane, leading out to her balcony. Then, she would hear the first chirps of the birds as the sun brushed over them, shaking the chill of night from each and every fluffy feather on their wings. The song of the beautiful birds ensured that every single morning she awakened with a slight smile on her lips, no matter what the day had in store for her. This morning in particular, Penelope felt a lightness and positivity coursing through her body. It was as though some bright, promising energy was enveloping her whole being. She tiptoed out onto her balcony in her nightgown, relishing in the feeling of the cool tiles underneath her feet and the warmth of the sun over her hands and her face. She stood on the balcony for quite some time, breathing in that brilliant morning air and gently humming in tune with the birds that flit from olive tree to olive tree just beyond her balcony railing. Every morning she watched the birds but there were two birds in particular that she was drawn to. There was an olive tree that hung over her balcony, brushing the railing ever so slightly. And in that olive tree, 
tucked in the highest, safest branches was a nest. The nest had been carefully constructed with love and care many weeks ago, and now it was full of eggs. Two bright yellow birds tended to the nest day and night, never seeing Penelope as a threat. They were a couple, a couple that was deeply in love. They took turns sitting on the eggs. Penelope couldn't help but notice that every morning the male bird would take over so the female bird could go off and find herself some breakfast. Before she left, the male bird would nuzzle her feathers, bidding her luck and farewell. Then Penelope would watch as the male bird peeked out from the leaves waiting anxiously for his wife's return. His eyes never left the skies as he waited for her, and when he finally caught sight of her cresting over the mountain-studded horizon, a brightness would flash across his nutmeg-colored eyes. It was love. There was absolutely no doubt about it. A love that few animals and few humans shared. And this morning in particular, Penelope ached for a love like that. With a war on the horizon, many people of Sparta were clinging to romance as their only comfort, their sole reason for being on this earth. But Penelope was alone. She wrapped a wool blanket around her shoulders, embracing the tender warmth with a weak smile. She longed to have a partner by her side, an equal that would love her the way she dreamt of being loved, who would make her a better version of herself. But few men in Sparta were interested in that. Helen was the woman that all the men dreamt of being with, and many battles were fought just to have her hand. She was a beauty, breathtaking in every sense of the word, and it made Penelope feel even more alone than she already was. No one was fighting battles for her, nor were they begging her father for her hand in marriage. She tried to pretend it didn't bother her, but it did. Marriage wasn't about survival or connections for Penelope like it was for so many others. It was about love and belonging. Eager not to dwell on what she didn't have, Penelope threw on a silk gown and headed out of the house, wanting to occupy both her time and her mind. She went to the library, her favorite place on the estate. There, she could read for hours underneath the filtered sunlight of an old oak tree. She could dwell in foreign lands and magical places. She could learn about places and plants 
and animals she didn't even know existed. She could read poetry aloud to herself, sweet as nectar on her tongue. And that day, she did just that. She nestled underneath the lofty branches of a powerful, ancient oak tree and popped open a few worn scrolls, reading as the soft sunlight kissed her skin and the fragrant floral breeze billowed her silk gown and hair. A shadow fell over her by the time she was about halfway through her scroll, and the cause of this shadow was not the clouds, not an unruly branch, but a handsome stranger standing over her with a smile on his lips. I thought perhaps you may want to read this, he chimed, his voice low and soft. With his rough hands, he handed her a scroll. Penelope regarded the scroll in awe. It was a poem, her favorite poem, in fact, but it had been missing from the library for quite some time. She told the stranger as much, and he apologized, admitting that it was him who had taken the scroll for reading quite some time ago. There was a spark in his eye, a charm and magic about him that was undeniable. Penelope's heart fluttered as she looked up at him, and little did she know, he was feeling exactly the same way. He introduced himself as Odysseus. Penelope's eyes widened with surprise. She knew of Odysseus, as did almost all the women in the region since he was the rightful ruler of Ithaca. Odysseus was a cunning man, a man of intelligence, kindness, and wit. He was the kind of man that Penelope dreamt of meeting, of being with. And Penelope was the kind of woman that Odysseus only caught a glimpse of in his profound dreams. While all the other men battled one another, desperate to marry Helen, Odysseus had his eye on Penelope. Though people spoke of his own intelligence and kindness, he truly believed that Penelope's surpassed his own. She was one of the most intelligent, witty people in the whole kingdom. People often spoke of things she had said or written, and Odysseus had fallen in love with her wisdom and her words well before he even saw her. But seeing her here and now, it just made him fall in love with her even more. Her olive skin, her hazel eyes that glistened a mossy green in the light of the golden sun, her black hair that was carefully plaited on her back, reaching down to her silk dress. She looked like a goddess. The two stood in silence for quite some time, merely taking one another in. Then, Penelope
Penelope sucked in a shaky breath, her heart still fluttering in her chest, and she moved to the side, motioning for Odysseus to join her. They sat under the ancient oak tree for hours. They read aloud to one another, sharing their favorite stories, poems, and novels. Penelope found herself clinging to every word that Odysseus read, and he found himself doing the same. Her words were like music to his ears, music that had been hidden from him for his entire life. Time seemed to pass in both slow motion and all at once when they were together. They both felt a kind of warmth that enveloped their whole being every time they caught each other's gaze, every time they laughed, every time they accidentally brushed hands while they were reaching for a scroll. Before they knew it, the sun had begun to set on the most brilliant day either of them had ever had. It crept closer and closer to the horizon, painting the sky a brilliant watercolor of scarlet, burnt orange, rose, and goldenrod. Penelope gathered her things. The two stood under the oak tree for a few moments, unsure of exactly what to say or how to end this once-in-a-lifetime interaction that they had shared. It was somehow as though they were both breathing for the very first time. Odysseus finally broke the silence. He bowed softly to Penelope with a glint in his amber eyes, offering to escort her back to her home, making sure she'd arrive safely. Penelope's heart skipped a beat at this request, and she felt her face flush a tender rose hue. She accepted, and the two walked back to her home. They talked of anything and everything on the walk, taking their sweet time. What was a meager ten-minute walk was transformed into a half-hour, and by the time they reached Penelope's door, the sun had fully set. Odysseus reached out, taking Penelope's hand in his own. With utter respect and softness, he brushed his lips against her hand, bidding her a good night. Before Penelope turned to open the door, she glanced over her shoulder at the handsome man who had been a stranger only hours ago. She asked if he would be visiting the library tomorrow. Odysseus smiled. If that is where you will be, my lady, then it is where I will be also. With that, the two finally headed their separate ways. The following morning, Odysseus kept to his word. As Penelope rounded the corner to the library with a spring in her step, she spotted him sitting under that oak tree, 
looking toward the horizon as he anticipated her arrival. It was at that moment that Penelope realized what was truly happening here. The look in his eyes as he waited for her to crest over the horizon reminded her of the look of that little yellow bird as he awaited his true love's return. There was no denying what was happening here, so they didn't. Every day they met under the tree and read to one another. They lingered for hours, gently brushing against one another, laughing, telling stories, and reading poems. They spoke of their views of the world, their hopes of the future, even the trials of their pasts, and every single second was brilliant. It only took a week for Odysseus to approach Penelope's father, asking to marry her. Her father accepted with no hesitation, knowing Odysseus was a good man. Their first day as husband and wife was one of the best days in Penelope's life. They crossed the threshold into their new home together, and with those steps, they crossed into their new life. And what a brilliant life it was. While most couples went their separate ways without so much as a second glance, Penelope and Odysseus were truly inseparable. They were a pair, a partnership, two halves of the same person. Every moment they were away from one another was a moment where they ached to be in each other's company once more. Every laugh, every smile, Every word exchanged between them only made their love grow more and more. Odysseus worked hard to create a space for Penelope to watch the birds every morning. It was something they shared together. Odysseus would sit with her on the patio wrapping a wool blanket around both of them. He would draw Penelope close, giving her a kiss on the forehead as they both shrugged off their slumber and embraced a brilliant new day together. Finally, at last, they both had the love they had craved they had found their soulmate, and every instant together was one that reminded them of what life is truly about. But then, something miraculous happened. Penelope fell pregnant with a baby boy. As she gave birth, Odysseus stood by her, brushing hair from her face and holding her hand tightly. They enjoyed parenthood side by side, just as they had done with every other bit of life together. They thought that they couldn't love one another more, that they couldn't love life more, and then their brilliant boy, Telemachus, came along. When Penelope held him on her chest for the first time, she realized that he was a wonderful combination of them both. 
He had Odysseus's stunning amber eyes, like pools of honey. He had her dark waves of hair and button nose, and it seemed her curiosity for the world. He reached up, tangling his tiny hand in her mane as his eyes filled with wonder for the very first time. When Odysseus and Penelope gazed at each other, holding their newborn son in their arms, there was a new kind of love shared between them. Once more, their life had become something new, and once more, they were reminded of what life is truly about. The next few months were the most delightful they had ever shared together. They would both awaken to care for the baby together. Some nights they would recite poetry to the baby in the moonlight, swaying him gently reminding one another of the first time they discovered that poem together. Some mornings, Odysseus would gently sway the baby side to side, side to side, side to side, as they watched the birds flit through the olive trees overhead. But, no matter what, the family was always together. Parental obligations tired them, but also brought them closer together. Parenthood ignited a spark between them that they didn't know could even exist. Every night when they went to bed, they thanked the gods for the blessing of their family, of each other, of what the future held. As the king and queen of Ithaca, they had business to attend to, but they always did so with one another close by. But soon their fairy tale life changed, and unfortunately, there was nothing either of them could do about it. The war was no longer on the horizon. The war was here, and Odysseus had no choice but to join the effort. Penelope was terrified of this, but she had faith in her husband, in her family, in the connection they shared. She joined him on the shore as he prepared to set sail for battle. She held their son in her arms as she gazed up at her husband with a smile on her face and tears trailing down her soft cheeks. How can you be smiling and crying at the same time, my love? Odysseus asked, wiping a tear from her cheek. Because I will miss you dearly, but I have no doubt you will return, my love, Penelope replied. She kissed Odysseus and clung to his hands, squeezing them with reassurance. As he walked away to get on the boat, Penelope watched him, her whole being aching to join him, to not leave his side. But, unfortunately, the war had other plans. Penelope went about her duties as queen. Every night, she sat on the balcony, looking out to the sea and waiting for her husband to return home. She would read poetry aloud, 
trusting that he would feel the words in his heart. She knew her husband was alive. She could feel him with her every moment of every day. And so, when after ten long years the war ended, and he still didn't return, other people of the kingdom weren't so steadfast in their belief. By the time another few years had passed, they believed in their hearts that without a doubt, the king was dead. Regardless, Penelope refused to give up hope. She sat on the balcony every night, reading to her son and keeping her eyes locked on the horizon, waiting for her love to return, just as the little golden birds had done on her balcony all those years ago. Her husband was the wisest man in the land. He was cunning, strong, and witty. She knew a simple war could not kill someone as brilliant as him. And, in her heart, she could still feel him with her. It wasn't long before the men of the kingdom began to flock to the castle, suitors desperate for Penelope's hand in marriage. Penelope turned them away again and again, telling them that she was married and her husband was coming home to be with her and the child that they shared. Soon that stopped working. The aides and fellow leaders urged Penelope to marry. The kingdom was without a king, and the suitors would eventually lose their patience. Penelope knew this to be true, but she also knew that all she had to do was buy time for her husband to find his way back to her. So, she made an announcement to the kingdom. She would remarry, but there was something she needed to do first. She would weave a shroud for Odysseus's father. And once the shroud was finished, she would wed the man of her choice. The suitors took this promise eager to have their chance at marrying the queen. But Penelope had other plans. Every day, people of the kingdom and workers of the kingdom would catch sight of Penelope working away at the shroud for Odysseus's father. She worked diligently all hours of the day, weaving a shroud made of beautiful gold thread that reminded her of the sunsets she used to watch with her husband. Everyone was pleased. They saw the queen hard at work and knew it would only be a matter of time before the shroud was finished. Little did they know, every single night, Penelope would tiptoe down to the shroud and undo every bit of work she had done during the day. It was an endless dance she did. Much like Sisyphus, she was destined to do the same task over and over and over. But unlike Sisyphus, she knew that one day she would be free from this task. She still felt the warmth of her husband's love in her heart. She knew he was somewhere over the horizon, trying his hardest to return to her and spend the rest of his life with her. 
This delicate dance went on for three years. The suitors grew frustrated with waiting, and because of this, they started to keep a closer eye on what was happening. Soon, they exposed Penelope for what she was doing. Intensely angered by her betrayal, the suitors stormed the estate, taking and destroying whatever they pleased until she would agree to marry one of them. Penelope knew there was no way to escape this. However, there was something odd she had noticed, something that filled her with hope. That warmth in her chest, the love of her husband, it was burning more intensely than ever, and for a good reason. The morning that the suitors stormed the castle, a beggar arrived on a rickety boat from a distant land. He was a man who had been through much in the past twenty years, a man who was finally returning home. To slip past the suitors and escape their anger, Odysseus disguised himself as a beggar as he approached the island. He had faith that somehow his wife would know it was him, that he had returned to live the rest of his life with her. He gathered at the castle with the rest of her suitors, waiting for her to make an announcement. His whole body was buzzing with anticipation. It had been many long years since he had seen his wife, many long years of him desperately waiting to be by her side, waiting to be reunited with her. The thought of being with her had carried him through the most challenging of storms. It kept him warm on the coldest nights and kept him going when he felt as though his body had given up. She was the guiding light for him through every challenge. And finally, today, he was to be reunited with her. When she opened the doors and stepped out onto the podium, Odysseus felt as though he couldn't breathe. She was even more beautiful than on the day he had left. He gazed at her as though she was the sun, all that mattered in the entire world. And when she began to speak, his knees grew weak. He had missed her voice. He had ached just to hear her speak one more time. Penelope told the suitors that to choose her husband, she was putting them to a test. The one who would pass the test would become the king of Ithaca by her side. The test was simple. Whoever could string Odysseus's rigid bow and shoot an arrow through twelve axe heads would become her husband. The crowd of suitors immediately leapt at this, seeing it as an easy opportunity to marry Penelope. Over the course of the morning, suitor after suitor tried and failed to string Odysseus's bow. It was an impossible task, one that only Odysseus himself would be capable of doing. They walked away, dejected and furious that they had lost their chance to have Penelope's hand, and with it, the entire kingdom. Then, it came time for Odysseus himself to try. With ease, 
he strung his trusty bow and shot the arrows through twelve axe heads. The crowd was silent, in shock. Penelope stood by with tears in her eyes, hands shaking. Odysseus pulled down his cloak, revealing his face, and though Penelope was delighted at the reignited hope of seeing her husband once more, there was anxiety welling inside her. Could it really be him? Was this a trick by the gods? She neared him, her hand outstretched, he pressed his palm against hers, and every bit of doubt drained from her body. The missing piece of her clicked back into place. An electric surge trailed through her body as her heart thudded with warmth. Tears stained both of their eyes as they embraced for the first time in two decades. The lovers were reunited once more. Penelope clung to him, burying her head in his chest as she drew him closer and closer. She told him that she knew he would return. She had held out hope all of these years. She knew that if he was in the crowd, if he had returned, he would be the only one able to string his bow. Odysseus brushed the hair from Penelope's face and kissed her gently on the lips. Lost in her eyes and in the beauty of this moment, he told her of the journey he had been on, of the odyssey he was on to return to her and their family. He never gave up hope that one day he would be back, holding her in his arms. He knew in his heart that she had remained faithful to him, that they would spend the rest of their lives together in utter bliss. And they did just that. After taking care of the rest of the suitors, Odysseus and Penelope went up to their balcony and watched as the sun set over their kingdom, their hands intertwined, their hearts aflutter. For the first time in so many years, they were at peace. Penelope gazed into her husband's eyes with a newfound respect and admiration, and he did the same. They didn't know they could possibly love each other more, but in that moment, they did. I hope you have enjoyed this story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please join me again tomorrow for another sleep story. Until then, Sweet dreams. Hello, and welcome to Soothing Pods Sleep Stories. Tonight, I will be your guide as we embark on a journey to ancient Greece, where we will follow the story of Achilles, one of the greatest warriors that ever lived. You've likely already heard many stories of Achilles' heroism and wisdom during the Trojan War. So, instead, we will dive into the story of his life, his childhood, his relationships, 
and his character in this incredibly colourful period of history. Curiously enough, the story of the hero Achilles began long, long before his birth. His mother, Thetis, was a sea nymph. She was a kind, beautiful woman, with a voice that was so enthralling it could make people fall in love with her with a single song. She spent long days sitting on the coastal rocks, singing into the mist with her fellow sea nymphs and dreaming of what her life would one day become. She would often wander along the seaside foraging from the ocean's bounty and gazing at the coast in awe and wonder. No matter how many days passed, Thetis never grew tired of the abundance that the ocean provided, at the beauty that it radiated day in and day out. She lived a peaceful life there on the coast, a life where she cared for the earth and the sea with nothing but appreciation and love. However, even in her serene days by the coast, her calm hours spent listening to the waves and soaking in the light of the golden sun, she could not escape the conflict of the gods above. Thetis's first encounter with the gods happened soon after Hephaestus was born to Hera. She struggled to accept her son's deformities and saw him as an embarrassment. In an effort to rid herself of him and the shame she felt, Hera cast her son into the sea, hoping to never see him again. But the young baby Hephaestus was heard by Thetis soon after he was cast down from Mount Olympus. Thetis had been relaxing on the shores of the beautiful volcanic isle called Limnos, soaking in the light of the sun and watching the waves move in and out on the white sand. The sound of the rhythmic ocean waves was soon overwhelmed by the sound of a baby crying. Touched and desperate to save whoever the child was, Thetis dove into the waves and wrapped her arms around the young child, cradling him kindly in her arms. She wrapped him in a cozy bed of seaweed and brought him ashore the island. It didn't take long for her to hear what had happened to the child, what the powerful goddess Hera had done to him. Thetis, knew she could not let an innocent child suffer due to the will of the gods. Especially a will as selfish as Hera's had been. So, Thetis decided to raise the young child on Limnos with the help of Eurynome, another water nymph. They gave Hephaestus a bright, and wonderful childhood, one that was much better than the one he would have received up in Olympus. But this wasn't the only time Thetis would raise a hero, or raise someone with great power. Thetis was a great beauty, and the word of her kindness and work ethic 
had spread across Greece and even up to Mount Olympus. It didn't take long before two of the most powerful gods had their eyes on Thetis, wanting her hand in marriage. From the peak of Mount Olympus, Zeus often found himself looking down to the sea in a daze, admiring Thetis as she wandered along the seaside and spent long afternoons helping those around her. When she sang, he would hurry out onto his balcony and cling to the railing, leaning as far over as he possibly could to hear her song. Down below, in his castle beneath the sea, Poseidon was equally mesmerized by the song of Thetis. Living so close to her, he had seen her kindness firsthand, and he was drawn to her as if directed by a binding spell. He found himself dreaming of her. He found himself wanting to do absolutely anything to make her his wife. But when Zeus and Poseidon learned of each other's intentions, they were forced to face one another. Poseidon claimed that he deserved to woo Thetis and have her hand in marriage. They had much more in common after all. Zeus was not used to not getting what he wanted when he wanted it. He coldly told Poseidon that he was to be the husband of Thetis, and Poseidon would not stand in the way of that. As they were arguing, a voice from nearby piqued their interest. They turned to see Prometheus, the forefinger and soothsayer, approaching them with a worried, knowing expression on his face. He told the gods, calmly and coolly, that it would be in neither of their best interest to marry Thetis. For long ago, there had been a prophecy delivered by Themis, an oracle of Delphi and the goddess of justice. The prophecy proclaimed that any son born to Thetis would become greater and more powerful than his father. Instantly, Zeus and Poseidon backed away from the idea of marrying Thetis. Both of them clung to their power with every fiber of their being, and they lived their whole lives desperate to keep it. Afraid that any son of Thetis would be far too powerful, they decided to marry her off to a man who had much less power than any god, a human named Peleus. Thetis did not want to marry Peleus. In fact, she didn't really want to marry anyone. But after some convincing from Peleus, and the knowledge that the gods would not wane in their demand, Thetis agreed and was wed to Peleus. Soon after their wedding, Achilles was born. Thetis loved her son dearly the moment she laid eyes on him, and she knew deep within her heart that he would do remarkable things. Every night, she would lie awake as the moon rose overhead. 
as it cast its silvery sheen over her beautiful son. She would gaze at him in wonder, admiring how precious her baby was. She had never loved anything or anyone as deeply as she loved Achilles, and with such love came the desperate need to protect him. Her experience with the gods had shown her how cruel they could truly be. She knew the dangers of having a son like Achilles, and she truly couldn't bear the thought of losing him. So, one night, she gathered Achilles up in her arms. It was a cool night on the coast of Greece. The briny ocean wind whipped her hair as she made her way slowly out of the house. Careful to avoid creaking floorboards and open the door without making a sound. She knew that Peleus would not approve of her plan, would not approve of where she was going. But she knew that she had to press on regardless. She had to do everything she could to protect her son. She made her way through the forest and nearby meadows. Overhead, the bright moon bled through the treetops, casting a beautiful mosaic of light and shadow on the forest floor below. The thick, plush moss glistened in the moonlight. The sound of the crickets chirping and the frogs croaking around her created a kind of harmony, a soothing soundscape to the journey that she was on. She held Achilles to her chest, singing a gentle lullaby to him as they made their way through the forest. Though the situation Achilles found himself in was out of the ordinary, he was smiling. Pressed against his mother's chest, held tight and lovingly in her arms, he knew that nothing bad could happen. He knew that he was safe, and her song soothed him even more deeply. Soon, they were on their way towards the underworld. At the edge of the dark forest, there was a cave hidden behind a layer of moss and plants. If you weren't looking for it, you wouldn't even notice it was there. However, those wrapped up in the affairs of the Greek gods were well aware of its existence. Thetis moved the curtain of plants aside and continued into the dark tunnel, into the cave that led to the underworld. She sang the lullaby a little louder to her son, rocking him more in her arms and trying to ensure that he was calm and knew he was safe. Thetis wouldn't have to go far into the underworld to find what she was seeking, because right at the entrance was the River Styx, a river that formed the boundary between Earth and the underworld, a beautiful winding river that was as dark and mysterious as the night. Thetis approached it and knelt before it. She could see her darkened reflection on the surface of the serene water. She took a deep breath and held Achilles over it. She told her son that this would be uncomfortable for a moment, but that it would be worth it. 
the river Styx would make him invulnerable. Wherever the water touched him would be impenetrable, and he would be able to live a long, happy life, a gift in a world as strange as their own. She clutched Achilles by the heel as tightly as she could. Desperate not to lose her wonderful son in the waves of the river, slowly she lowered him into the water. Young Achilles did not cry. He did not even look confused. He simply smiled at his mother as she lowered him into the water, and when she pulled him out, she wrapped her arms around him, wanting him close. Thetis rocked her son and soothed him as she dried him off. She hated to have to do something like this to her son, but as she looked at him, a smile grew on her face. There was a magic sheen that seemed to glisten across her sun, as if he was covered in golden drops of the sun. He was glowing in her arms now, and in that moment she knew that he was invincible that she had helped save her son. The next few years of Achilles' life were full of love and long sunny days spent in the beauty of nature. His mother and father rarely spoke of the prophecy about Achilles and his greatness and power. They wanted him to be a happy child with a full loving life. And yet, it seemed that attaining greatness and waging battle were inescapable for him, like they were a part of his destiny. From a young age, he would gather sticks and act out pretend battles in the vibrant green grass of the countryside around their home. His mother would try to shoo him away from it, but his father encouraged it, knowing that fate would be fate regardless of their intervention. Achilles' strength and wit were also obvious from a young age. He outwitted many of the children his age, and in his village, he seemed to be the leader of every game and every event the children took part in. His natural abilities to lead and be in a position of power were undeniable. And soon, Achilles wasn't the only child in his parents' house. His parents took in a young boy of Achilles' age named Patroclus. Patroclus had been an exiled child, left to fend for himself before he was offered safety and love in Achilles' home. Very quickly, Patroclus and Achilles formed an inseparable bond of deep friendship and brotherhood. They spent endless days together playing war in the woods, identifying plants and flowers, and telling each other stories under the tree shades. On rainy days, they would sit beneath a big oak and tell each other tall tales, trying to scare one another with each clap of thunder. They loved each other, and understood each other in a way that few people get to experience in their lifetime. Every night, they would lie beneath the covers 
them talk about their understanding and beliefs about the world around them. They found themselves in a beautiful union, companions and best friends for life. But then, when Achilles was nine, it was foretold to Thetis that her son's fate was either to gain glory and die young, or to live a long but uneventful life in obscurity. Upon hearing this, Thetis was absolutely devastated. She did not want to lose her son, to lose the light of her life. And so, she did the only thing she could think to do. She decided that she must keep him from serving in the war in any way possible. She disguised Achilles as a young girl and sent him to live with King Lycomedes and his seven daughters. It was a lush life, a life even more extravagant than the one that Achilles had been living. But he knew that it was not his fate. While the girls were encouraged to forage, to sow, to do art, Achilles struggled to follow those rules. His urge to fight, to grow stronger, to lead, it was all simply too much for him. He often found himself getting in trouble. He formed close bonds with the girls, who tried to help him see that living there was in his best interest. Many days, Achilles found himself dreaming of his life back home. He spent long hours wondering about the prophecy that had been spoken of him and he wasn't the only one. The Greek army had heard of the prophecy, but they also knew it would be nearly impossible for them to win the Trojan War without Achilles by their side. And as such, they began to seek him out. They spent long weeks and months combing through the countryside, doing absolutely everything they could to try and track down where Achilles had been sent. Eventually, they got word that he had been disguised in the court of Lycomedes. The Greek heroes, Odysseus and Diomedes, set out to the court of Lycomedes with a plan in mind for finding Achilles in the large group of young girls. They disguised themselves as salesmen and arrived in the lush court with bags full of jewels and clothing that they believed the young women would be interested in. They poured them out on a table and the women swarmed them, admiring them in awe and turning the precious jewels over in their hands. Achilles, still disguised, was in the thick of it, staring at the jewels from afar with little interest. Then, Odysseus and Diomedes set newly made weapons out on the table. They were stunning swords and shields breathtaking weapons that would make any warrior look twice. Achilles couldn't resist. He took the swords in his hands and swung it around, checking the weight and the power of the incredible weapon. He was practically glowing as he held it, and as everyone looked upon him, they couldn't deny who he was. Odysseus and Diomedes took Achilles by the arm, leading him away from the court of Lycomedes. Achilles went without resisting, 
deep in his heart, he knew that he was needed to win this war, and every part of him wanted to fight in it. And indeed, Achilles did fight. Right from the start, he was given command of a fleet of fifty ships. He was the fiercest leader that the Greek army had. There was little that slowed him down, and his wisdom well surpassed his years. Fortunately for Achilles, his role in the war saw him reunited with his beloved Patroclus. By now, they had both grown into men, and they had many, many years to discuss with each other and stories to tell. Patroclus was a warrior leaps and bounds above many other soldiers, and as such, the two spent long hours discussing strategy and their plans to win the war. But, along with that, they often found themselves reminiscing about their childhood days together. They both recalled the long days they had spent running through the serene woods, and the magic moments they spent lying beneath those beautiful towering trees, admiring the way the sun shone on the leaves. The afternoons they spent mock fighting one another, trying to outdo each other in their make-believe worlds. It was a precious time in their lives, the time of their lives that would give them much peace and comfort through their battles of the Trojan War. The Trojan War was a long one. For ten long years, the battles raged on. Achilles was undefeated, winning every single battle that he found himself in. Patroclus was always by his side, encouraging him, guiding him, and offering a listening ear for both strategy and his feelings. But soon, tragedy struck. After being disrespected, Achilles stepped away from battle, refusing to fight. Patroclus took his place in leading his army, and though the battle went well at first, it took a turn for the worst. Patroclus was killed by a Trojan hero named Hector. When Achilles learned of this, he was stuck with grief and rage. He turned to his mother for comfort and support just as she had when she took him to the river Styx. His mother held him and protected him in her arms. She rubbed her son's back and promised him that things would be all right. They spoke of the beautiful times he shared with Patroclus, of the beauty of their bond. This helped Achilles, but he knew he needed more. He wanted to avenge Patroclus, and he vowed to do just that. Thetis, his mother, knew that the prophecy was coming to a head, that her son may meet his end after avenging Patroclus. But she also truly knew that she could not stop fate. In his rage, Achilles struck down Hector. Even after doing this, Achilles' grief made him restless. He refused to allow Hector's parents to bury him. But soon that changed. Hector's parents met with Achilles. Together, they all wept over the senseless loss of the people they loved. They reflected on their lives together on the joy they had shared with the people they loved the most. Eventually, Achilles was able to let go of his hatred, of his anger, of his thirst for revenge. He wished Hector's family well and sent them on their way. The rest of the battles that Achilles fought were full of a strange peace. 
He felt grateful for the life he lived with Patroclus and his family. It was Paris, one of the instigators of the Trojan War, who finally killed Achilles. He fired a single arrow that struck Achilles in his heel, the only part of him that was vulnerable. As Achilles passed away, he wasn't sad, nor was he scared. He was at peace. He had been a great hero. He had loved deeply. He had fought bravely. And now, he was ready to rest. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.